We have Luis Sierra. He's the assistant director for the California Center for Cooperative Development. I met him um, many moons ago when he came to San Luis. At the time, we were working on a uh, project, uh, distribution project that I think he's going to mention for the Central Coast Ag Network, which still exists. We're going to be hearing from Nikki today. It's kind of shifted. We're moved away from distribution models, focused a little bit more or a lot more on um, uh, ag education. But anyway, Luis, thank you for being with us. Appreciate it. And I'll let you adjust this. Session. OK. And this is uh, probably That's working on it. Great. OK. Hello. Good morning. Um, I'm Luis Sierra, and uh, I wanted to um, uh, thank everybody for coming out here uh, nice and early on a Saturday morning. Um, I feel like I am in a lineup of really great speakers, and I might be the most unknown of, uh, of all the speakers that you've had um, since yesterday. And so I just wanted to introduce myself a little bit and tell you about my role in developing community-based food systems. Um, my experience starts probably, and I want to give a shout out to my mentors, um, Live Power Community Farm in Mendocino County and Full Belly Farm were the first places that I started to really understand uh, farming and marketing. And, and so Live Power Community Farm is um, uh, famous for being probably the first community supported agriculture farm in California and is still one of the only uh, community supported agriculture uh, farms that um, uh, that, uh, that lives uh, based on its relationship with about 200 families um, all around Mendocino through the San Francisco Bay. And so they have a, a, an essentially um, a closed food system, um, a mutually supporting food system between consumers and farmers. Um, and I also spent some time at Full Belly Farm. Um, and, and so the families there um, are also really very inspirational and pioneers in the organic farming movement. And my other roles in uh, community-based food systems have to do with farmers markets development and management. Um, I had moved to Salinas and got to know some students at Cal State Monterey Bay who were looking to uh, create a, a farmers market in one of the, I guess, more working class um, cities in the Monterey Peninsula, Marina. And, uh, and that is a market that started about 2003 and has now expanded to about five farmer's markets. So I'm really proud of the work that we established um, back then and, and to see how it's grown to be a vital part of the, um, of the farmer's market um, community. Um, I also moved to Davis and became assistant manager for um, a bit for the Davis farmer's market and one of the first, or really, um, the, one of the first and largest, and I'd have to say one of the best, I'm really proud of what the Davis Farmers Market is and its role in supporting you know, about 50 farmers. Um, uh, so, I am a uh, co uh, cooperative developer, and, and my entry, or my, um, uh, my learning about cooperatives has happened um, almost by accident, and probably starting um, uh, at UC Berkeley when I was a student, there was a, um, a group of students um, who started the composting collective, which turned out to be the Berkeley Worms. And we, made, we just collected uh, the dining commons scraps and, um, and turned them into vermicompost. So I think you got to see some pictures here of um, the Cal Poly uh, composting project, um, which you should be really very proud of. And, um, it, 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 I looked back fondly at my experience of, of being a, um, a student composter and learning about being a worker cooperative because we essentially organized as a worker cooperative. Um, I uh, moved more and more into marketing and uh, spent some time at the Rural Development Center, which is now called the Agriculture and Land-Based Training Association. Students um, and graduates there um, moved off the land uh, onto about 60 acres, and I moved from being an intern at the nonprofit to becoming a sales manager. I was essentially volunteered or um, uh, recruited to be the sales manager. And that was a, also a project in which we learned about, um, uh, about starting a co-op by just doing it. Um, the project had a, uh, a somewhat short life, and it taught me a lot about what's important about cooperative development. And now that I'm in Davis, uh, my life is, is kind of uh, really beautifully enveloped by cooperatives. And it starts with my limited equity housing co-op. So I, I live, I wake up in, in, in a housing cooperative. Um, 
the Davis Food Co-op was also started, one of the, um, uh, the second wave of food co-ops in California started in 1974 and is a thriving part of um, the Davis uh, food system. Uh, and my son is part of a, a child care co-op, or my family is part of a, of a child care co-op. So um, my life is, is now very beautifully cocooned in the cooperative world, and I um, enjoy the benefits of, uh, of cooperation. So uh, as the Center for Co-op Development, um, we develop new co-ops, and we support existing co-ops, and we do public education about co-ops. So the first thing we should do here and, and uh, is, is define what a cooperative is. And I really like to keep things as short and simple uh, definitions of no more than 12 words um, because I could put up here um, about seven principles that the International Cooperative Alliance um, uh, has uh, uh, promotes for cooperatives, but I like to really keep it uh, this kind of universal definition. Cooperatives are simply businesses that provide its members a service at cost. And, and to dig a little bit more into this, I mean, we are talking about businesses that uh, don't survive by charity. They, tr they survive by the good work that they do and the efficient operations um, that they provide to their members who are um, really, we should say, we should call members owners. That is actually what a cooperative member is, is that they are, they are the owner of a, uh, of a business that provides them a service at cost. And this is a different orientation, this idea of service at cost uh, from um, a publicly traded business or any other kind of private business that um, largely exists to uh, create wealth for the owners. Uh, and cooperative businesses, their main function is to, um, uh, to provide a service. So we say that they are a kind of Nonprofit, because um, profit does not belong to its owners according to how they invest in a business in their in their business, but according to their use of the cooperative. And I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm going to use an example here coming up here about uh, uh, San Luis Obispo um, uh, uh, Farm Supply. So. I want to give you this, this, this definition of a cooperative and, and, and make the connection between cooperatives and community-based food systems because uh, I want to first think about, I want you all to take a second here and, and define for yourself what does a healthy food system look like. Just take 20 seconds here to think about what characterizes a healthy food system. Keep that in your mind. I uh, think a lot about this, uh, and I, uh, I want to uh, recognize uh, Ken Meter of the Crossroads Institute for, I think, giving me probably the best and also shortest and sweet um, uh, definitions of what a healthy food system is. And some of you who are a little bit older might remember Ken Meter, um, who came to the Central Coast and did one of the first food assessments um, uh, uh, in 2004. And it covered, I think, Ventura all the way up to Santa Cruz. So it included um, San Luis Obispo. And as part of his presentation, he also defined this for, uh, for San Luis Obispo. And this is what he and I now believe, this is what makes up a healthy food system. Um, it should provide us uh, healthy food that we know the source of. It, pro it produces wealth for the region. And it should help us connect with each other. This is how we can say that a, uh, a player, a business in a, uh, in a, uh, a, a food system um, is contributing towards a, health, a healthy food system. So to get more general, uh, a food system, I think, comprises all of these things. Uh, and when I actually first came up with this list, I did not put farm supply in here, but it was really getting to know San Luis Obispo farm supply um, that I got a better understanding of really how important uh, and vital the, uh, the farm supply um, world is for a healthy food system. So we are talking about everything from production uh, and the full loop, moving around to education, um, because that is how people become informed about um, about healthy food choices and, uh, uh, and their role in a food system. So 
So, your farm supply. I think you should be familiar with this. How many of you have been to the farm supply, right? So Jim uh, Braybeck is the general manager, and he would like to say hello to everybody. He wants to thank Cal Poly because um, he recognizes that uh, every single manager at, uh, Cal, uh, at San Luis Obispo Farm Supply is a Cal Poly graduate. So he wanted to make sure and tell Hunter and everybody here, um, thank you for um, creating really what makes, Cal, uh, 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 what makes San Luis Obispo Farm Supply great. So... Farm Supply uh, has 2,700 member owners, and I do use, I like to combine the word member and owner together because that is who the 2,700 members are. Um, it's been open since uh, 19, uh, 1950, I think it is, so they've been around for 65 years, and all but two of those years, they've been profitable, and in the cooperative economics world, we generally refer to profit as, um, as surplus. Um, and uh, because uh, there is this surplus, um, uh, what happens in the, in, for the farm supply is that that surplus belongs to its, its members. And, and every year they declare a, um, a, um, a patronage dividend or a patronage refund. And that means that the surplus is divided um, amongst all its members according to how much they had purchased throughout the year. And, uh, and uh, as member owners, they are also responsible for financing, so they also keep a little bit of that money to, to finance their growth and, and, and keep some money for reserves. So every year um, when a, uh, a surplus is, is declared, 30% of that goes back to each of their uh, 2,700 member owners, uh, and the rest of it comes back about five years later. So every year people are getting checks for the year that they uh, posted the profits and from a few years back. And so when we think about um, one of the tenets of what a healthy food system is, that it should provide wealth for the region. Uh, here we have a, a company that uh, instead of being owned by either being a publicly traded business um, that has shares on the stock exchange um, in which owners can be from anywhere in the world, or it might be just a handful of, of people that have put in a lot of money to run the business, um, that profit, all profit belongs to owners. And in San Luis Obispo, the business that is about, um, about uh, distributing supplies for farms, uh, it goes, it's distributed amongst 2,700 people within this county, mostly within this county, a little bit in Monterey. So we have an economic system that, um, that returns back to uh, its community instead of either siphoning it or concentrating wealth. So this is one of the things, you know, this is a great example of how a successful co-op um, is able to generate wealth for the community while providing a good service. They've been able to do this by changing with uh, San Luis Obispo's um, agriculture. Uh, Jim reminds me that uh, for a lot of the existence of, um, of the farm supply that uh, dairies were um, a large part of their business. And at one point, they had there were 300 dairies in San Luis Obispo, and today there is, there's one, and it's, it's here on campus. Um, and they were able to understand what changed in the dairy industry, and they also saw how wineries grew. Um, and they have changed with the times. So this is one of um, two remaining farm supplies that are cooperatively owned in California. San Luis Obispo and Stanislaw County. Um, even probably 25, 30 years ago, we might have been able to say that there were about 30 farm supplies, but those farm supplies did not have the good management, the good decision making that has allowed farm supply to change with agriculture. So this is also one of the important parts of being a cooperative. It is a business and it needs to respond to, um, to the market and to the, the needs of its members. So, I'm going to introduce another um, topic here, um, another thing for you to, to chew on, and you probably heard this um, throughout your, your day yesterday, about this concept of a regional food hub. Um, and uh, I, I've been working on uh, projects that, uh, that involve the concept of a food hub, and, and uh, USDA has some ideas of what uh, a food hub is and has interest in promoting it. But the problem is that it's hard to understand what a food hub is because 
Has anybody seen a hub of any sort? Can you think of a hub of any sort that you have known of? I'm seeing mostly questioning looks, right? Um, the food hub concept uh, uses a lot of words that add a little bit of mystery. Um, we talk about integrated food distribution, coordination, aggregation. Um, uh, they're words that, that, that maybe don't quite get to what is actually happening. We are talking about actual businesses that are distributors, uh, grower shippers, commercial kitchens, um, um, uh, even school districts. These are people who handle food and, um, and provide it to the public. But when we talk about a regional food hub, we are talking about components that really focus on local with a capital L. So here we get back to understanding the idea that a, uh, a community-based food system and a healthy food system is about um, uh, knowing where your food comes from and hopefully having a, um, a virtuous circle. Um, so when we talk about what a regional food hub is, um, uh, we can use a lot of these words, but we, we can just take it down to being a business that, um, that, that handles food um, that, um, that is largely local. So it puts these regional food hubs into something of a disadvantage in that the number one um, quality of food that people look for, well, um, think about this for a second, what is the number one quality that people look for in food? And you might be thinking about organic, you might be thinking about healthy, you might be thinking about pesticide free, but the reality is, what's that? Fresh, those kind of things. I would. Yeah, there we go, yes, okay, so we're talking about freshness and price. The number one quality that people look for in food is convenience. They want it when they, they want what they want when they want it, and they want it to be easy to get to. And that is, the, that is what makes any business uh, successful um, in distribution and in retail. Uh, so uh, we sometimes put ourselves at a disadvantage when we talk about really focusing on local because sometimes the product is there and sometimes it's not. Um, and this is part of the challenge. Most of my work in cooperative development is about local, um, uh, locally based um, cooperatives. So I want to bring into, um, into focus um, what some of the challenges are in this food hub development, community based food systems, and also cooperatives by talking a little bit about um, one of the projects that we worked with and that Hunter did too and that was born out of the Central Coast Ag Network. Um, Central Coast Ag Cooperative started about 2008 or so from members of Central Coast Ag Network, uh, of, of the network, who um, uh, a lot of the members are producers and they were interested in um, using the platform of the network to market um, and realized that they needed to turn it into a business. At that same time, um, George Work of Homegrown Meats had found some funding for uh, uh, creating California's first mobile harvest unit, mobile slaughter unit, mobile harvest unit, I'll use those same terms. Um, and this is about 2004, found the money, got it built, and then realized that the, uh, the health department and USDA meat inspection um, departments um, had no idea what to do with this and the regulatory environment was really onerous, so it sat. Um, for a handful of years. A and it was the Central Coast Ag Cooperative that, um, that ad adopted the unit and did the hard work of actually putting it into use. So Coast Grown is, um, uh, had 17 members. Uh, half of them were ranchers and about half were vegetable producers. All based largely in San Luis Obispo, a little bit in Monterey and a little bit in Santa Barbara. Um, so it was about a local food system. It was a business that was about all about marketing truly authentic local food. Um, and to do that, they, they set up a website to be able to uh, enable online ordering uh, and made a lot of good connections and had a lot of good promises for people to purchase from that. Um, and they uh, then operated a, a reefer truck in a warehouse so that they could deliver to restaurants and, and grocery stores. So they had a lot of accomplishments. Number one, they did good planning. Um, they, they recruited all the members that they needed. They developed the, the, the HACCP plans from scratch, that's health and critical, critical control points plan that USDA needs. Um, and, uh, they developed quality, sustainability, and 
ethics standards for their members. They raised some money. You know, they, they decided that um, they should all put in about a thousand bucks each uh, to help finance the work uh, and get started. They managed to also get a loan because they were able to raise that money from themselves. And they actually got the, the mobile harvest unit running and started processing some beef and lamb. Um, they set up the website with online ordering capacity and they got their manager, they hired their manager, right? Um, so uh, the problem is that um, within about two years, all operations had, had stopped. So here we, we start to learn a little bit more about some of the challenges in developing a, a community-based food system and in establishing a, a cooperative uh, business. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what were some of the challenges here. Um, while they had a good business plan, there were some, some guesses in there about how things would work. Um, and so some key assumptions didn't hold. Um, and a lot of it had to do because nobody had done it before. So for example, they made assumptions about how many animals they could put through the slaughter unit. And it was it turned out to be about half, a little bit less than half uh, that they could actually put through given the schedule of the, the meat inspector and um, the lack of actual true mobility of the mobile harvest unit. Um, so their revenue was already suffering from not being able to um, provide as much service as they expected. They also expected that um, that the great connections they made um, would, um, would materialize in online orders, um, but the, the food world being you know, an ancient business still relies on a lot of communication. So uh, they didn't really get any orders, um, and the assumption about not necessarily needing a full-time sales manager um, meant that they had very few sales, right? Um, they picked out $1,000 as what you need to get started as a, um, a, 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 a something that was palatable and significant. But it maybe wasn't quite enough. Um, maybe if they would have raised two, three, or definitely 5000 they might have been able to get over the hump. Um, and uh, they had a loan that was not really for what they um, needed it for, which was for working capital. Um, so without a sales manager, they also suffered from um, two things here especially. One is that that HACCP planning took a lot of time, a lot of staff time, um, because nobody had done it before. And they also had um, uh, got the thing running and the cut and wrap facility that takes the slaughtered animal and turns it into marketable meat, um, they went out of business. So all of a sudden, everything that they had developed for creating this, this closed system here on the Central Coast went out the door when they had to still ship their, um, their carcasses um, either up to uh, Petaluma or in the, uh, the Central Valley. Um, and they also had, you know, there was, a, there was a previous drought here previous to 2011. And at that point, they also had to get rid of their, uh, a lot of their animals. So, I mean, the good news is that the mobile harvest unit is working, and um, it's JNR Meats in Paso that operates it. Uh, they first leased it, and I think that they've now purchased it. Um, so when I think about um, whether or not Coast Grown was a failure, I can't really describe it as such. I have to say that, that the folks were very courageous in doing this and very innovative, um, and that they were midwives for creating uh, a, a significant component of, uh, of a community-based food system. Um, it is a real challenge for California ranchers to be able to find a place to be able to process their animals from start to finish. And in San Luis Obispo, you have that now, thanks to the really very hard work that, um, that the farmers and ranchers of Central Coast um, put in. So, I uh, am realizing I'm at a, we started a little bit late, Hunter, could I get another 10 minutes or so? Yeah, we're at 9.30 right now. Um, so another point in, the, um, uh, in a community-based food system and another role that cooperatives play here in San Luis Obispo. Um, San Luis Obispo Natural Foods uh, Co-op. Um, how many of you um, have shopped at it? Oh, that's great. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. Did you see that, Gwen? <laughs> Gwen is our uh, general manager of San Luis Obispo Natural Foods Co-op. Um, so how many of you uh, were members of the co-op and had shopped at the co-op before this store? Can you keep your hands raised? It's about half of you, right? Okay, good. Okay. So uh, I will, uh, for the benefit of telling some history, you know, I, as a cooperative developer, I needed to get to know where the food co-ops were in California. 
Um, and when I w was researching, um, uh, I had heard that there was one in San Luis Obispo, uh, and I looked for it on different directories and even on Google Maps, and I came to the conclusion that, that the food co-op had been out of business for a while. Uh, because I think this is what I found. I, I found a, st a store that didn't quite look like a store. Um, and, and in getting to know, finally, I think it was uh, with Gwen and Eric, I got to learn a lot about um, the history of San Luis Obispo Natural Foods Co-op. It's been around since 1978, um, and it's been always at that location up until 2012, right? 2013? Um, and um, it was... It was, uh, it, was, it was in a phase, it was developed in a phase where um, uh, food co-ops um, uh, had certain stances or certain, um, uh, certain ideals. Um, the food, the food co-op was where you, uh, where you could go and you could be assured that you would not be sold white bread. There was no refined sugar. And there was a, uh, organic produce was marked by it being kind of ratty and maybe a little bit dirty. That's how you knew it was organic. Uh, in the 30 years since 1978, uh, the market has changed, um, and there are a lot of offerings of sustainable, organic, healthy foods from all sorts of other um, retailers. So we, as we say in, in, in our world, the market had moved away from the store, um, and the membership had fallen from 600 down to about 200 or so, right? Um, and those folks were shopping at other places because they were able to get more of what they needed and what they wanted, right? So, there's a little bit about more of the history. Towards the end, um, towards the end, it's, it's still around. Towards the end of the, the old site, um, they had start, really started suffering some losses and really suffered from the exit of, of membership. So, um, and you know, stepping in there, it was like, wow, I'm stepping into a different decade into the store, uh, into a time when, um, uh, when there was no competition, right? So now, uh, there is not somebody from Slow Money today, but this is where we get into what's, what uh, I, I think is really important about building community-based food systems, and that is um, about community financing. Um, and it was Slow Money, Slow, that, um, that was formed, um, I think, at about, what, 2010 or 12, some, sometime around then? And uh, it is a, a group of people that... Um, that, that finance food and farming projects um, that are sustainable. Um, and uh, San Luis Obispo Natural Foods Co-op was their first project. So this is not necessarily an, an investor's club, it's just a group of people that get together and, um, and strategize together, uh, but make um, independent loans to, to, to small-scale businesses. Uh, and San Luis Obispo Natural Foods Co-op was one of the first ones. Um, between um, a handful of members put in about $50,000, that, and that allowed them to move to this much, um, much larger store, but is still, still a little bit small. Um, and here we're looking at Eric Mickelson, who is a starter, uh, because he was also part of the Coast Grown Cooperative, um, and, uh, and a great supporter. So this was part of the move. Um, in 20, this is now 2494 Victoria Avenue, which is parallel to Broad Street, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and it is a really beautiful store. This is also part of during the move. And now the store looks like, well, it's, it's an inviting store. It has a lot more to offer. Um, and is still really very focused on what is local. I mean, that is what um, uh, Slow Natural Foods Co-op is, is about. Um, right. So to give you an idea of what kind of scale um, Slow Natural Foods Co-op operates, I mean, at the old store, it was, I think it had gross sales of about a million dollars a year. Is that, that's about right. Um, and now that they moved into this store, um, these are some of the changes that I think are interesting. Um, now you're at about two million. And, um, uh, and membership has now grown to about 800, so it's the highest it's ever been. And this has also happened, you know, the, uh, uh, you've had a, a kind of a somewhat locally based um, regional chain uh, of grocery stores that was just purchased by Whole Foods. And I don't know about correlation and causation, but the, the numbers at Slow Natural Foods um, say that, um, that when that purchase happened, membership increased at an even greater rate. 
So it tells me something about the community in St. Louis Natural Foods Co-op that there is an interest in supporting a, co a truly community-based uh, food system that is owned by the people of, uh, of San Luis Obispo. Um, and, and it's something that, that I, I feel needs to be recognized and you should recognize. Um, so important things, why, and so if you wanna think about you being a, a community-based food system builder, what you can be doing for San Luis Obispo uh, Natural Foods Co-op is becoming a member and uh, shopping there so that they can reach the $2.5 million revenue um, uh, requirement so that they can join the National Cooperative Grocers, uh, which is a cooperative of food cooperatives. And that will allow them to uh, go in on some bulk purchasing uh, or some, some, some contracts with, uh, with, uh, uh, with some distributors that will allow them to get some of those core kind of cereal and frozen goods and uh, the essentially non-local items that make a store like this really convenient. Um, it, it is what, um, uh, what will allow the food co-op to really reach a, uh, a new level. And then we can think about moving into maybe a 10,000 square foot store, right? Um, so this is a, a project that we've been supporting uh, for the past few years and have been really impressed with how, um, how they've been able to really manage this, this change and become a more significant player in the local food system. So uh, it's the, the financing world that uh, when, we, when we think about, when we talk about the founders of slow money, um, they start with the belief that, um, that sustainability, the problem of sustainability and sustainable food and farming businesses is not so much about the production practices, it's about the financing. Um, and the cooperative model allows each of you to be able to participate in that through your farm supply, through membership in a food co-op, um, if you're a farmer, we're always interested in helping uh, you examine opportunities to create um, uh, uh, agricultural marketing cooperatives. So I'm going to leave on that note. You have some opportunities in front of you to become community-based food systems builders. Thank you very much.